Musquash was once a thriving and prosperous little town on the Bay of Fundy, boasting several factories, mills, a railway station, and a port. All of that came to an abrupt end when the town was completely destroyed by a forest fire in only two hours, one afternoon in 1903. You're listening to Backyard History, the hidden stories that happened in your own backyard. The podcast version of the weekly history column running in newspapers across the Maritimes with your host and author, Andrew McLean. The town of Musquash in New Brunswick, Canada, was in 1903 nestled along the shores of the Musquash Estuary. Today, the Musquash Estuary is an important nature preserve known for its rich biodiversity with marshes, mudflats, and tidal pools that serve as habitats for a variety of fish, shellfish, and migratory birds. Back in 1903, though, Musquash was a thriving, tight-knit town. The townspeople shared a strong sense of community spirit and relied on one another for support and companionship. Driven by fertile farmland and ample fishing, the community of Musquash had been steadily growing for some time. However, in recent decades it had dramatically grown even more into a prosperous town because of the lumber trade. The thick woods in the area led to a lucrative lumbering business and several factories and mills in the area, including the Knight's Mill and the Clinch's Mill, who were the two largest. St. John's Daily Telegraph newspaper once wrote that, the hearts of the settlers in the parish beat with joy at the bright prospects of a very prosperous village. The fire that would destroy that thriving town had begun a couple weeks earlier, relatively far away. The forest fire had likely been started by a lightning strike. As soon as the reports of the forest fire began to trickle in, local volunteer firefighters set off immediately to get it under control. Fire was always a concern. But in the beginning, this one did not seem to be either particularly large or particularly ominous. Rather, it was just one of many little forest fires that were burning in that hot, dry summer in the Maritimes. All of that quickly changed, though, when the remains of a tropical hurricane swept through on the night of June the 2nd. By the following morning, that small forest fire had become a raging inferno. During the night, the acrid smell of black smoke began to waft into musquash. The flames were rapidly moving towards the town. Despite the smoke that morning, the townspeople were not aware of the speed the fire was moving at that day. The Moncton Transcript newspaper wrote that Isaac Linden left his house in the morning to put out crops on a farm two or three miles away. At that time, the fire seemed a long way off. While some people were nonchalant, the mood was growing more anxious as more smoke began to pour into the town. Even more men set off towards the fire with buckets and shovels. One newspaper report said that Every man in the place able to carry a bucket is out fighting the flames which is moving down the river. By noon, it was all too obvious to the townspeople that something was seriously wrong in the forest around Musquash. The black smoke darkening the sky had grown so thick that lamps had to be lit at noon in order to see. With the men gone off to the forest to fight the fire, the women and children, fearing the worst, began to pack up their worldly goods into wagons. Only two hours later, it became clear that it was too late to fight the fire. By that afternoon, according to the Daily Transcript, During the afternoon, the conflagration came in with a rush. A shift of fire swept in from the woods. The fire was moving too quickly now. The townspeople had to abandon their homes and set off immediately to have any hope of saving their lives. A mood of chaos prevailed. The skies were too dark to see anything. The winds howled. Thick ashes and burning embers fell from the skies. Despite it being all too clear at this point that they had to flee if they had any hope of saving their lives, Instead of immediately trying to make it to safety, people checked on their neighbors, trying to help them to safety. The Moncton Daily Transcript wrote, Their efforts failed to save their homes and they tried to assist their neighbors, but from house to house they were driven. 
and despite all their strength and engineering, they finally fell back, defeated and ruined men. As the people of Musquatch fled on that dark afternoon, unable to see, their destination was the marshes of nearby Gooseberry Cove. There, they hoped to reach the safety of the shallow, swampy, muddy waters of the Musquash estuary, where the flames could not reach them. The fire, however, was traveling too fast and the smoke was too thick. People got lost in the midday darkness. Families got separated amid the heat, the wind, the swirling ashes, and the confusion and the chaos that was raining. The St. John Daily Telegraph wrote, the women and children hurried away from the homes which were quickly vanishing to the marshlands where there was no fear of the fire getting any hold. There they remained through the night, many of them most scantily clad without food for everything was wiped out. They spent the night standing in the marshes of the Musquash estuary while the flames roared around them and ashes and cinders fell from the skies. While that newspaper rather understatedly remarked that, it was a hard experience. For the townspeople, it must have felt like the end of the world. And indeed, it was the end of their world, of the lives that they built in the town of Musquash, of their farms, their fields, their houses, and their barns. Not everyone made it out alive. Several elderly people were unable to make it out in time and perished in their houses. The farmer Isaac Linden who had left his house earlier that morning to help another farmer plant his crops, later learned that his wife and her sister, named Susan Teekles, had been at home when the fire swept in from the woods. They had quickly fled their farmhouse on foot for the safety of the marshes at Gooseberry Cove. However, when they realized that their horse was still tied up in the barn, which the flames were rapidly approaching, they went back to free the horse. Susan Teagle's charred body was found with her hand still on the harness of the dead horse. The farmer Isaac Linden would only learn what happened to them from reading the newspaper. The next morning, after the fire abated, the dazed survivors emerged from the marshes to survey their town. They found that very little of it remained. The Moncton Daily Transcript wrote that where there was once a thriving community whose people were all employed, there is now nothing but smoking wilderness. Piles of brick, lime, and debris mark the spot where once stood the dwellings, churches, stores, barns, schoolhouse, factory, lumber camps, sportsmen's cabins, mills, dry shed, barns, and railway station. Of the 110 structures in the town, only six remained. The newspaper described the residents wandering around the ruins of their homes. Strong, sober, industrious farmers, millmen, or lumbermen were seen standing about with haggard faces, hardly knowing what to do. Private homeowners insurance was not common until the 1950s. In the absence of a social safety net, because there was no unemployment insurance for those whose jobs were now gone, there was no old age security or Canada pension plan for the elderly, these forest fires meant that survivors had lost everything. Under the headline, Scene of Destitution, the Daily Telegraph wrote the following of the people of Musquash's prospects. The majority of those who have been left homeless are unable to help themselves and are at present at loss to find a way out of their difficulties. The old men who have lost their homesteads and contents and even clothing are in sorry straits. Most of these before the fire were content in knowing that they at least owned their homes in which they could leave quite peacefully. They were independent. Now their homes are gone and their livelihood are taken away. What they will do in their remaining days is to some a perplexing question. A six-year-old girl standing in the marsh that night watching the flames devour her hometown later recalled hearing someone say, my full seat win a glass of water by my bed and I will never be able to afford another set. Their only hope was donations. And in that regard, Musquash was relatively lucky that it was close to the wealthy big city of St. John. When the news broke by the disaster that had befallen Musquash, a spontaneous flood of St. Johners went to City Hall to make donations. Even though the fire had not even remotely affected his city, the mayor of St. John declared a state of emergency and called out the militia, ordering them to Musquash to help the survivors. 
Charity fundraisers such as baseball games and church dinners were organized within days to raise money for musquash, while St. John's newspapers encouraged donations by publishing the names of donors. Sadly, what happened to musquash was not in the least bit unique. Fires raging out of control, destroying forests, farms, and even entire towns were an all-too-common part of summer in the Maritimes. Within that very same week of musquash's destruction, forest fires obliterated several other, even smaller New Brunswick farming communities and small villages, including Hopewell Cape, Black River, and Balls Creek. In many ways, the suffering was greater for the survivors of those forest fires because they were further away from large cities and didn't encounter the generous help of St. Johners that the people of Musquash did. There was also nothing unique to New Brunswick about the forest fires that year either. At the exact same time as the fires reached Musquash, another forest fire was ripping through Yarmouth in Nova Scotia. Yarmouth would suffer catastrophic damage in that inferno, and as if that wasn't bad enough, another, even larger forest fire was at the same time fast approaching the outskirts of Truro. Then, on June the 6th, the Daily Telegraph triumphantly announced, Rain last night gives cause for thankfulness and hope. Fire stays its destructive march. While that rain would mark the end of the forest fire season of 1903, the thing is that 1903 was not even a particularly bad year for forest fires. In the greater scheme of bad forest fire years, the 1903 destruction of musquash would barely even register. Indeed, 20 years later, in 1923, a considerably larger inferno would again rip through the musquash estuary, dealing considerably more damage to the region. But these big overall numbers about which year was worse for forest fires meant nothing to the people who had lost everything in that once thriving little town of Musquash. Everything they built was gone, and they, like so many other Canadians over the centuries whose lives were touched by forest fires, now had to leave their beloved homes to try and start a new life from scratch somewhere else. The Moncton Daily Transcript said, simply, that after a forest fire, Where there was once a thriving community, there is now nothing but smoking wilderness. That was Backyard History, with your host, Andrew McLean. Thanks for listening, and stay tuned for another hidden story that happened in your own backyard. Produced by Jordan Lozier.